Aloha hockey fans and welcome to the Blue Note Fan Report. I'm your host, Guy the Hawaii Blues fan. And this is the program that is by a fan for the fans. And you got to know most definitely about you the fans. I actually can't believe it's May 27th or 28th and we're sitting here talking about the Blues actually playing hockey. I don't think they've ever played this late in the year ever. And in fact, I know when they play game three, that will be the first ever hockey game in June in St. Louis Blues history. And I can't think of a better person to share this history with than one of my favorite guests and friends of the show. Please welcome Mr. Tom Calhoun. The legend himself. Tom, welcome to the Blue Note Fan Report. Or I should say welcome back. Guy, good to be back with you again. Glad to uh, be talking to you about meaningful hockey. Is it, isn't this just amazing, the fact that here it is, May 28th, and I'm pretty sure that the Blues have never played hockey this late, ever. Yeah, uh, I don't know when they would have, because I know the Stanley Cup, uh, back in the days when they... Uh, went to the finals was played much earlier in the year. It was uh, like an early May thing. So, yeah, so yeah I, it's a pretty amazing thing uh, approaching June, and we're going to have a home game next Saturday at uh, Enterprise in it. Oh, pretty exciting we'll, stuff. We'll, we'll talk about that game a little a little bit later. Um, but the, So I did some, a little bit of research. The last time the Blues played in the Stanley Cup Finals, was May 10th, 1970. Yeah. 49. Yeah, that, uh, Go ahead, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, uh, I remember vaguely watching it on television back in those days because I was already a Blues fan. Uh, I'm old enough to have lived at that time, of course, and uh, uh, remember vividly Dan Kelly calling the game on CBS television back in those days, and, uh, you know, we kind of knew that the Blues were up against it playing the Bruins um, that that year, as they had been the previous two years against Montreal, and uh, we weren't really surprised, I guess, when they were swept in four games again by Boston, um, because you, you know how the story goes, they were all... The, the Blues were representing the expansion teams in the Stanley Cup final. Yeah. It was all... The six of the new teams that were expanded that back in 67, 68 were all in the same division for the first three or four years of uh, their existence and played one another to get to the Stanley Cup final. And uh, the, the really good teams, of course, were the uh, original six teams that uh, Montreal, Boston, New York Rangers, uh, uh, Toronto, and who am I forgetting? The hated Blackhawks. Uh, oh, the Blackhawks, of course. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so everybody knew what the deal was, and if the Blues would have won a game, it would have been a tremendous upset. Of course, they didn't. Um, but, uh, but it was really cool having your own hometown team playing for a championship back in those days. Uh, didn't get one, but then uh, now's a chance to turn that thing around. Yeah, I know. Um, I was, uh, for me personally, I, I'm thinking I was in either fifth or sixth grade, somewhere <laughs> around there. And the house that I lived in, I had, we had bought the house a couple years earlier, but there was, we were still finding stuff from, you know, the previous tenants. And I found four of those commemorative Pepsi bottles that had, you know, the blues, <laughs> the six years in the league and six years in the playoff. And I remember looking at that bottle and going, oh, it hasn't been that long, and it won't be that long before we get back to the finals. <laughs> well, it's uh, been a long struggle, of course, for the team. Uh, for a while there, it was a struggle just to stay viable in St. Louis. You know, the, the move to Saskatoon was something that scared the heck out of us there for a while back in the, uh, back in the mid-'80s. But uh, that was uh, averted, and... You know, we've had our uh, we've had a few chances since then to uh, get to the finals. It didn't work out, but but now it's uh, it's a real time to be cherished by anybody who cares about the uh, the blue note on the sweater. 
Yeah, and, and that that's absolutely right. It is it is a time to be cherished. Um, so we talked just before the beginning of the playoffs, and you made a prediction that these guys were going to go farther than they'd ever gone before. Now, to me, that was winning eleven games. That was that was what you know, getting at an eleven game mark, because uh, that's the farthest they'd ever been. And right, you had said, and I remember this vividly. We got the Jets, and I was like, "Wow, he's making that statement." And, and believe it or not, it really didn't look like the Jets were ever in that series. Even when they won the two games in St. Louis, the, the Blues never showed that they were worried at all. Right? It just never felt like that was a, uh, uh, oh my God, we could lose this series. Well, I will go back to uh, that conversation that we had the last time. Mm -hmm. And I think it has played out pretty well. I think I said something like the Blues' depth is what I'm really yeah. expecting to pay off for them in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And and really, I think all three teams that the Blues have played so far, Winnipeg, Dallas, and San Jose, have had difficulty with the fact that the Blues could put out any line at any time and be happy with that and not have to juggle their lines as much as the other team did. And I think that has uh, that depth that the Blues have displayed so far in the playoffs has really been uh, the deciding factor in how they've gotten to where they are. You know, uh, when you can get contributions from the fourth line like they have, in fact, they've started the fourth line most games the last two uh, in the last series. And, um, you know, Sunquist and Harbuschev and Steen and all these guys who you wouldn't look at and say, oh, they're going to be the difference makers. Yeah. Well, they have been. You know, they've been right there along with the big name guys as far as uh, the contributions to getting them down the road to where they are now. Yeah, the, well, that start in the fourth line, i got to hand it to Baruby. That... You know that was in the psyche of the Sharks right off the get-go, right? And then when mm -hmm. um, in, in game, I might make sure I get this right, in game five when Barbashev scored that fluky goal 38 seconds into the game, yeah, you just, I, I mean, it, it just felt like, wow, something's happening here, you know? Well, it's really been a magical ride, and, and you can't understate how important Craig Berube has been in this whole thing. Uh, he has pushed the right button at the right time, both personnel-wise and I think player team psyche-wise. Mm. Um, you know, when the hand pass happened and they got uh, uh, shortchanged, let's yeah. call it, in that game, and right away he made the decision to go in the room and tell the guys, look, we're not going to bellyache about this. We're not going to uh, whine about it. We're going to use it as a confidence-building mechanism, or at least in his mind that's what it was. And, um, and we're going to go on from here. We're going to make sure that that doesn't define our playoffs. And, well, you know how they played after that. It's well, they were just like that. So what I find amazing about that was he didn't just go in the locker room and tell them that. And, and that's because they have video of that. Him walking in the locker room, everybody's like talking about how they're, you know, you could see the emotion. And he just, he, he says, that's it. It's over. It's done. Game four. That's right. all we're going to focus on. When you do your interviews, game four. Right. Then he walks out of there and, okay, you know, that's fine, coach. I got it. Well, coach is going to go out on the podium and whine about it, right? He steps mm -hmm. up to the podium and says, do not ask me about the hand pass. It happened. It's over. Ask me about game four. Right. My jaw dropped. My <laughs> jaw dropped because that was what? And, and on NHL Network, they talked about it. They said that was genius because now the players, not only did he tell the he did it. Led by example. Right. Went out there, led by example, and, and that was it. And then game four, I, God, Tom, to have been at game four, that that was, the, of the final three games, that was the toughest one. But even once they got that 2-0 lead, it never felt 
even in that last two minutes, I mean, I know you were there, so you felt the nervous excitement. I never felt that yeah. nervous about it. Well, you know, when I'm working there, I don't feel so much either. I've got a job to do, but uh, there was plenty of that excitement and nervous uh, energy in the building that night, that's for sure. <coughs> Excuse me, and I could feel that. The um, Getting back to your point about Craig Berube, I, you know, I haven't had a chance to sit down and talk to the guy yet, but uh, it's obvious that whatever he says to the team is meaningful. You know, these players these days in professional sports, a lot of times, you know, hear a, what a coach has to say and they all kind of, yeah, okay, whatever. But I, I know that from the feeling I get around the team and from what I've seen in interviews, you know, they really think his words are meaningful because they're coming from a guy who's played over a thousand games in the league and he knows his way around a little bit and uh, he has the respect of other people in professional hockey um, and so I, I, I would really be surprised at this point if he doesn't get coach of the year uh, even though he's only coached a yeah. part of the season yeah. uh, because um, you know he's taken this team and he's done, done a 180 with the roster he's, he's you know Personnel moves, psychological moves, they've all been just uh, gold. And not only that, think about, you know, going to Vladimir Tarashenko. And Vladimir Tarashenko is a pretty humble guy. Pretty from, from what I've seen, I don't know him personally, but from what I've seen, he, he's, he's a very humble, very team-oriented guy. But he does, you know, he, he's very um, competitive. And when he's not, when he doesn't feel like he's contributing it resonates in his game because he gets madder and madder and madder and it makes it worse. Ruby had a talk with him and said, dude, play defense. Start playing defense. Didn't tell him mm -hmm. to worry about scoring. Told him to play defense. And what happens? Goal, goal, goal. And then history. The first yeah. ever successful penalty shot in <laughs> Blues history. And that, that was that in was San Jose though, right? That wasn't in St. Louis. That's right. Yeah. yeah, it was in San Jose, but it was mighty, uh, mighty fun to watch on TV from where I sat. It was, yeah. uh, you know, and I said to myself before I took the shot, if he makes this, the series is over. Yeah. And, well, you know what happened. Yeah, and Jones, Jones, like, gave it to him. Jones didn't even move. They were killing Jones on the, the yeah. prognosticators were killing Jones. I mean, on the NHL Network, when they do their breakdown, they were destroying Jones. He didn't move. He didn't challenge the shooter. He just gave him. I mean, he, they said Vladdy had his pick. Vladdy could have picked any spot he wanted and scored a goal. You know, and you can't do that to a guy that good. Well, it's true. Uh, you know, I think Jones could have played it better, no question about it. But uh, I don't think there's many people who have uh, they can't cover the whole net, and with uh, uh, Tarasenko, if he gets a little bit of a spot to shoot at, you know, they're in trouble. Yeah. So you mentioned this a little bit, and I want to talk a little more about it. You and me talked offline a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm calling this play the greatest singular play in St. Louis Blues history because I think it changed our history, and that's the hand pass. Mm-hmm. And I know you. I don't think you've been asked a lot about it, but you were right there when the referees came over to talk about this. So you, you did. We did talk, and you did say you didn't hear what they seen. But I'd love to know what your impressions were, and what your was going through your mind, and what was happening, what you were seeing when that play happened, and the confusion and the the the, the aftermath of the hand pass. Well, you have to understand that when things like that happen, when big things happen in the in the game, I immediately go into a mindset, well, what do I need to do at this point? Do I need to make some kind of announcement? Do I need to be ready for, uh, you know, my final script to say goodbye to everybody? So I'm not 100% concentrating on what the referees and the linesmen are doing at that point. I did see them skate over and huddle up right in front of me there um, at the scorer's table. 
but I, like you said, I, I can't hear any of what they're saying. I saw a few hand gestures uh, uh, that in, seemed to indicate that they were talking about the hand pass. What they said to one another about the hand pass, you know, they might have said something like, well, I saw a hand, what well, might have been a hand pass, but I'm just not sure he touched the puck or something like that. I, who knows what they were what they were saying? There's no definite way to know that. Um, but it was um, it was certainly I thought an opportunity for replay to get it right. You know, uh, if there was the opportunity to review it. Obviously, the way the rules are set up now, and you know everybody knows this at this point, uh, you just can't review that particular play. Well, I, I, I think I'm it's going to stop you there. See, this is where, and I want to, I want to put this out there because this is actually the narrative that everyone wants, but that's not true. They actually had, and they have an article that would have allowed them to review it. They decided not to use it, and I can't remember his first name, but Campbell, and I think he's the director of Campbell. some part, I, and I, I can't remember his title because this is off the cuff between you and me. But he made, in uh, talking to um, the NHL's afternoon show in Canada, and I got him, I'm free, I can't remember it, because he said, yes, Article 9 says that you can, ha you can review for a legitimate good hockey goal. And he brought up a few cases. One of those cases, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because this case happened earlier in the Eastern Conference Finals, is if the puck hits the upper netting and then comes back into play. Well, that happened, and no one caught it. They didn't try, they didn't go back to replay, and they dropped the puck. Well, after they went to commercial is when NBC showed that it hit the upper netting. Mm -hmm. so they could have used it then, but they decided, but it, 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 it just got missed. He, then he makes the statement, and I'm gonna try and keep my, my emotions very low, I don't think the San Jose Sharks would have been very happy if the first time we used that was in Game 3 of the Western Conference Finals. Yeah. The thought that came to my mind, Tom, and, and I know you and me have a lot of expellatives, who gives an F what the San Jose Sharks think? The play was wrong. How can you be upset at a wrong play? Well, you know, the... Officials have a tough job. You know yeah. that. We all know that. I, I absolutely uh, agree. Sometimes they're put in a situation where they can't win. And I think some of the guys with the league uh, were put in a position to make the best of a bad situation. And, you know, I, in fact, I, I wanted to talk to Tim Peel, who was a backup referee at one of the following games after that, about it, and you know, obviously, he couldn't talk about it. He said so. And we all are put in situations sometimes where you'd like to say something, but you really can't uh, in order to defend other people. Oh. And I, I really think that's how it went. Yeah, and, and, and I get Tom, I get that. I mean, and the NHL done something that's absolutely, as far as I know, in recent memory, unprecedented. They've suspended six officials. During these playoffs, yeah. that's that's saying something. And, and you and me, I, I don't know if I've talked if I talked with you, but I've talked in my show about how bad the officiating is in the N in the NHL and the perception problem that the NHL has because of it. Um, however, with all that being said, I'm going to say this, and this is probably going to make you laugh. I'm glad they screwed it up. I'm <laughs> absolutely, positively happy they didn't review the play and restart it. Because it was the moment when that team, the world's against us. We're going to do this for the against because we're everyone wants somebody else to. They they came together in, in a way. Well, it turned out it, it turned out well, you know, for the Blues obviously because they used it as a, a motivational tool, and you can't. Uh, you can't go back and change it once it's done, and they realized that right away, and, and it was it was over with. So why dwell on it? Why make it something that uh, we're going to use it as an excuse? We're not going to do that. Let's go on and win this series and forget about what happened tonight. And you know, you're right. It, it turned out to be a 
a good thing. We wouldn't be saying that if they'd have went on to lose the series, but uh, certainly it turned out that way. I have a show that I did after Game Three that I didn't release, and I I sat there because it felt it felt a little like sour grapes. But I made the statement that I felt the NHL should have absolutely disqualified the San Jose Sharks. I mean, unprecedented because. And, and the reason I said that is, one time, okay, no problem. Two times, you got me shaking my head. Third time, there's something going on. And when this one, and, and this one gave an actual game away. You know, it just, the, and, and I don't blame, the Sharks have nothing to do with this. I get it, whatever, and I understand human mistakes. But the NHL has, a, and I talked about, has a perception problem. And the perception is, and I'm not talking from the casual fan, I'm talking from the core fan. The core, the hardcore, I'll watch the NHL no matter what fan, that the NHL and NBC, or in, the NHL lets NBC dictate what happens in the NHL. And, and it is, I mean, it's in the groups, it, it, it's all around, and true or not, it's the perception. And that's sometimes the only way to break perception is do something drastic. And that, and I, and I know it sounded like sour grapes, and that's why I didn't release it. But it's it's out there. Well, you're a fan, and uh, fan is short for fanatic. Yeah. And uh, that's uh, that's okay. That's what the sport needs. But it also needs people who uh, who trust it. Yeah. And if uh, if they start losing a little bit of trust because of uh, rulings that don't go a certain fan base's way. For good reason, uh, then then it's a problem. And I think when these kind of things come up um, at the general managers' meetings, whenever that next one is, yeah. certainly they will address it, and hopefully they'll come up with ways to fix it. Yeah, the 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 refer the officiating problem is is definitely, and, and no one wants to blame the officials. They really don't. And and I've talked to other YouTubers, and they tell me I try not to talk about the officials, and, and I do too to a point. But when it gets so horrendous, you can't ignore it. And, and that's that's you know, and that's a, a problem. And enough about the bad stuff. I want to get to the good stuff. So, before we get to Game Three, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, I want to ask you from the playoffs to now, or from the beginning of playoffs to now, what's one of your best memories? Well, till now, uh, uh, certainly for, for, for this playoff after the Western Conference uh, Championship. I mean. You know, we hadn't seen that before. At least I hadn't seen that before. Um, so it was wonderful to see people who had been, by association with the Blues, struggling all these years to feel good about themselves. Yeah. Suddenly, be able to hug one another and associate with a team that could call itself champions. And people who worked in the building for years and years, people who worked behind the scenes that I know, were all smiling, hugging, high-fiving, uh, people with the team, people behind the team, all around that building that night were just ecstatic. And I think that's what a winning team does for a fan base and a community. It makes you all feel good about yourself. And um, being a Blues fan suddenly took on a whole different meaning and a whole different uh, atmosphere than what it had been for the last 50-some uh, years. So that's what's most meaningful to me is that uh, the people who've been there through thick and thin all of a sudden got a lot of thick to enjoy. I mean, how fitting was it that that was a stormy, rainy night that was covering <laughs> everyone's tears? Um, I yeah, told people and how fitting time, was it how fitting was it that all the outdoor events, including the Cardinals game, were all pretty much canceled because of weather? So the, all the focus was on the Blues that night and the uh, the indoor game. Yeah. The um, I told I told people I said the last time the Blues did this, I was a year and a half year, I was a year and a half old in diapers and crying. Well, I'm still crying. <laughs> I'm crying and getting crying tears. Tears of happy. Oh, it was, um, yeah, I, I could not stop the tears coming down my face. It was so amazing. And, and I want to ask you about this. So you, where you sit, you have four, five, maybe, I think five 
officials from the NHL. They're not they're not um, associated with the Blues at all. They actually work for the NHL. I know there's right. one in each penalty box. Uh, you have the official score, and there might be somebody for the playoffs, maybe one or two extra people. They had showed a, a shot of you just before you got to say those famous words. Um, the guy in the right-hand penalty box, I think that's our penalty box, just kind of looks at you and with this, he had a smile on his face. Like, they're supposed to be impartial, but he knew it, right? Yeah. Did, did any of them say anything to you? or? No, no usually, uh, you know, after the game, they're uh, doing their job. You know, usually, and the NHL off-ice officials, most of the guys are, are local people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, have a connection to the team, let's say. But they're NHL officials, and they're supposed to be objective about their job. You know, nobody gets favored. And, and they're, they're great at that. They do their job, and they do what's expected of them by the NHL. So um, even smiling at that point might not have been the thing to do for whoever that might have been. But, uh, but. Yeah, they. Uh, what I remember is that they they gathered up the pucks, they uh, headed back to their room behind the uh, behind the rink, you know, and uh, you know they talk about what their job's going to be for the next game. So, um, uh, in answer to your question, no, I I didn't really know what they were doing at the time. Okay. Well, that's, you know, great. I mean, that's, that's a really good answer to see that, to see how the inner workings. I love that fact. So... And by um, the way, you're counting a little bit off. You're fine. Come in on. each penalty box, there are two mm -hmm. NHL guys. One uh, is there tossing pucks mm -hmm. from the Blues uh, penalty box. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever a puck is out of play, they need a new one. And that guy also opens the penalty box door. Mm -hmm. The other guy in the box there is uh, the... Uh, game timekeeper who makes sure that the game clock that is displayed on the uh, end boards is is accurate. He keeps it. He keeps a stopwatch on play starting and stopping. The guy sitting next to me is the penalty timekeeper. More often than not, that's Larry Weaver, and he's uh, been doing it for a long time. Uh, and he keeps track of the penalties when people go in and out of the penalty box. And then in the other penalty box, the visitor's penalty box, we have um, the guy who opens the door for the players. And that person is also on a headset to Toronto, the war room up there, yeah. uh, in case there's a need for a video review. And the other person is the uh, timeout coordinator who uh, makes sure that the, um, the commercials in the TV are taken at the appropriate time and that the puck is dropped after the TV break at the right time. Uh, that's um, they do, I mean, for the most part, the officials, the off-ice officials and all that, they do a great job because you don't know they're there, right? And that's the great thing about an official. You, you want to never hear your name called out. And I, and I do think that's a great job. I should also mention the guy who runs the clock, mm -hmm. uh, Ed Hook, on most nights. Uh, he's, he works for the building, and he is the best there is, and there's nobody better at it. Just let me put it that way. Because a lot of times when they drop the puck and they have to restart it, you know, if the uh, linesman decides that the puck was dropped unfairly, you have to reset the clock. And he's right on top of it all the time. And uh, some other buildings, you'll notice, it takes a while for the uh, clock operator to catch up yeah. after they uh, uh, need to reset the clock. But Ed's all over it. He's, uh, he's as good as there is. Wow. So... We're, we're talking on Sunday, Memorial Day weekend, Monday, Memorial Day, game one in Boston, the first Stanley Cup playoff game that we've gone, that the Blues have been a part of since 1970 against those same Boston. Um, I talked to one of my show about all the irony and the deja vu and the karma that's been dripping through this series. To think that mm -hmm. we're playing Boston. And here's, th this is really, for me, really interesting. In 1970, the Blues were the number two seed in the West. The Bruins were the number three seed in the East. The yeah. Blues were the home team. Didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. To, to have this flip-flop is amazing. 
So game one is on Monday. Game two is on Wednesday. And it is something that the NHL's done here and there, but not every year. They've decided to do a two-day split in travel days. So because right. of that, game three in St. Louis is not on a Friday. It's on Saturday, June 1st. So the first... Yep. The first... Stanley Cup playoff game in St. Louis in over 49 years will be on a month the Blues have never played in before, and that's just amazing to me. And I'm get, I know this is a long-winded question, but uh, when we last talked, you had told me I've never announced the Stanley Cup Finals game, and that's something I really want to do. Well, my friend, on June 1st, you're going to get to introduce the NHL Western Conference champion, St. Louis Blues. And I have a surprise for you. I get to hear you do it live. All right. Coming in for the game. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, I have... Excited for you. I have acquired tickets in Section 121. Gave me a decent price, and, and I'm working on, on the flights now. But I am going to be at Game 3. Well, you know, uh, I, I can say this. I don't think there will be anybody in the whole building more passionate about the uh, the Blues and the outcome of the game than, uh, than the guy, the Hawaiian Blues fan. Oh, man. <laughs> it, it is... Um, and and I, I've been thinking about this a lot, and um, I, I, I'm hoping that I'll, I'll get a chance to. to I'm, I'm in, in that area, not far from you, so I'm going to try and come over. I know you're. I know you're going to be busy. But I'm trying to come over during pregame skates or whatever. I, I got to say hi, and I hope you're okay with that. Um, but I'm hoping that there's a moment during your announcements where you make a pause, and I can once again yell at the top of my lungs, "We want the cup." <laughs> You won't be the only one, probably. Did you hear him at the end of the game on uh, oh. the uh, clincher for the Western Conference Final? There was two or three chants that went through the crowd, we want the cup. And just to, just to be able to hear that, it was, you know, sent chills up my spine. Yeah. That was uh, great. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm super excited. I'm actually going to try, and I don't know how possible or feasible this is, I'm going to try to do a live show somewhere Saturday. I'm only going to be in town for 30 hours. Um, I had wanted, yeah. and if I can make it happen, because I know I can't do it on Blue's property without permission, and I know I'll never get that, but I was going to try and go across the street and do a show across the street. So uh, I, I, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's, and, You'll and find if, a way. Say again? You'll find a way. <laughs> <laughs> the sailor will come out of me. Um, the the yeah. The... the, the and it's just even sitting here now, just talking to you about it, I'm getting choked up. Just thinking about the fact of how many people have waited so long. And then you, you, you kind of mentioned, you know, the, the, the ones that have been around for a long time. I think about the ones that aren't here anymore, right? Right. Um, I think about that, that plaza out there and how many of those bricks are memorial bricks, you know, for, for people who have unfortunately um, departed and it just, and, and then I think, and, and I know this is weird, I think of Pablo Demetra, right? It's like that night that it was raining, it was like those were his tears and Barclay's tears and Wick's tears and um, Bob Basson's tears. Like they were just letting us know that they were there for us. Yeah, and you know, I was associated with... <coughs> Some people back when I first started doing this job that are no longer with us too. Uh, the great Dan Kelly and um, yeah, Harry that. Arnest was the owner when I started doing the job. Yeah. He's he's passed, and so is Mike Shanahan and Jack Quinn and Ron Caron and some of the people who were important uh, people with the Blues back in those days. Uh, and I'm sure wherever they are, they're smiling with their. Uh, Blues uh, logo on their chest uh, at, at what's going on right now. It's uh, 
just a very, very special time. And like I put in a blog post a little while ago, we all need to cherish it because who knows when and if this is going to come around again anytime soon. So, so let's all just soak it up and enjoy the heck out of it. Yeah, it's um, that. That's why I'm spending the money to go. I mean, whether I got it or not, it, it, it's this is something. Even if they make the finals the next five straight years, it'll never be 49 years again. At least, God, I hope it'll <laughs> never be 49 years again. Because I know I won't be around then. But it's the. I know how a Cub fan feels now. I remember when the Cubs went to the World Series a couple of years ago. I'm like, eh. Not a big deal. We go all the time. No, I know how a Cub fan feels now. I really know how they felt. <laughs> um, well, um, you know, if, if I get a chance to say it to the players and the coaches, uh, I definitely want to make them understand that what they've done this year, whether they win the Cup or not, has really, I think, changed the, the entire feeling around the team. Um and I want to thank them for all the sweat and tears and broken bones and torn ligaments and things that they suffer through the course oh, of the, the season to uh, to make this all a very special time for all Vlad, of us. Vladdy and his special smile. You know, he got that <laughs> this year, right? Um, yeah, and Vince Dunn, I think, lost a few teeth here the last few days, too. So, well, uh, well, you know, uh, these, guys, uh, these guys play one of the toughest sports there is to play, and uh, and I don't know how many people appreciate the kind of physical abuse that they take. Yeah. So I'll, I'll ask you this: I know I don't know how well you're connected with the team. Do you have a status on Vince Dunn? No, I just know that he traveled to Boston with the team, and so that would indicate to me that uh, you know he wants to be an option for uh, Coach Peruby to use. Um, whether it be in game one or per perhaps maybe in game two, but uh, I don't think he would have traveled if there was no chance for him to play. That is actually really good news. He's He's been, uh, him and Robert Thomas and um, uh, Sunquist and a few others just being gritty out there. And Steen, I've not been a Steen fan at all. I, I thought this year Steen was part of the problem in the locker room. At least, you know, I've heard, you know, I, I've few small connections and what was coming out was pretty negative on Steen but the way he accepted that fourth line role I give him all the credit in the world I mean this this is a KG veteran who could have just said screw this I'm not a fourth line player instead he's mentored you know I mean Sunquist isn't that young but he's still been a minor player elsewhere where now you have him as a major player in uh, Thomas Thomas could be a superstar, thanks to Steen. Well, I think um, I think Alexander Steen, uh, if he's being honest, would say would under would tell you I understand that physically I'm not the player that I once was, uh, but I still have plenty to contribute to a team. You know, this is a team, and I can help pull this team together and steer it in the right direction with what I still have to offer both physically and mentally and, and I think he's done that in spades I, I, like you said I, I give him all the credit in the world for uh, being the team guy that he is and um, pulling in the right direction yeah it, it's, it's been absolutely uh, wonderful um, I've taken so much of your time Tom I, I really appreciate it um, I, I, go ahead and mention your blog where you put that post out, and I'm going to try and share it. Uh, share it here. Well, I, uh, I put up a little Twitter link to it uh, uh, on Twitter earlier and Facebook. Uh, people might find it there, but it's uh, uh, you can go to my website paguycom.com, and my blog is on there, and you'll you be able to click on it and see it there. Yeah. Well, I, I, Tom, you are an absolute just you're a legend and I know you don't like that term you, you kind of were mad at me the last time I used it but sir you are a legend and one of my last questions is and, and I hope I know the Blues have done some repairing of mended fences amongst former employees have you heard anything if they're going to invite Ken Wilson during any time I've not heard anything about that no um, you know Ken uh, 
kind of went his own direction, of course, after he left here. Um, I'm not sure exactly what he's doing at this point in his life. It would be it would be great to see him again. Uh, I actually, uh, during the summer, worked for the Gateway Grizzlies baseball team, minor league team in the Frontier League here in, in the area, and um, uh, he was one of the owners when I first started working for that team. Uh, and uh, he's not associated with them anymore, but, but he helped get that team off the ground. So, uh, you know, I, always, I was always friends with Ken and uh, had a good relationship with him. If he came back around for the, for the playoffs, uh, I would hope he'd be welcomed by the team and I certainly would like to see him. Yeah, this actual, this jersey right here is actually signed by Ken Wilson. He was, um, really? he was here in Hawaii when I first moved back here and was associated with, mm -hmm. um, after he left the Blues, he was associated with uh, um, Hawaii Winter Baseball for a while and one of the radio stations and TV stations. And I, the last I heard, he was doing something with baseball up in Washington State. But um, That's the last I heard, too, yeah. I had, it was right around the time that Brett Hull was going to get his 500th goal or something like that. Or no, actually, my, this was after he retired. It was at the time that he was going to retire his number. And I had asked him if he was going to go, and he says, no, the team will never invite me. So, I mean, mm. it gave me the impression that there was some bad blood there. Well, you know, time heals a lot of wounds. Mm. Um, a lot of the people who were here at the time uh, when he was um, let go um, are not, aren't around anymore. Uh, you know, time, like I said, time changes things. Maybe, maybe there's a different feeling about it now, and hopefully, maybe that fence can be mended. We'll see. Yeah, I, I, I really do hope that the Blues would reach out to him and, and bring him in for at least one of the two games in St. Louis. And, and while I say that, I'm going to let you know what my prediction is. And I've talked a little bit about the deja vu and the karma and the, the uh, irony that has just been running through this playoffs. It's absolutely, especially from 2016, we did almost the reverse of what we did in 2016. Mm -hmm. We lost in six, we won in six, and uh, the fact that we're playing Boston, and the last time we played Boston they swept us, I'm gonna, I, I know other people have gone out there and said this, but I absolutely believe that when you announce game four, you're going to announce the Stanley Cup champion St. Louis Blues. That would be special, that would be really spectacular. I. I I don't know that I see the same vision you're seeing, but if we win it in six, I'll be happy with that, too, because <laughs> that'll be an all well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I figured you wanted four or six, right? Yeah, well, either four or six is okay with me. I, I If they win it on in seven, I'll live with it, but I'd, I'd really like it to be four or six. Yeah, I would I would hope that there, there are some people that if there's a clinching game in, say, five or seven, that you would be one of the people the Blues would invite to be there when it happens. <laughs> that would be great, uh, but uh, you know I won't hold my breath for that. Uh, you know they've got a lot of other things, bigger things to worry about than that. So you know I'll take it as it comes, and uh, if it comes during Game Four or Game Six, uh, I'll be extra pleased. <laughs> oh, I, I know, and not only that. I mean, I won't get to see the parade, but. Um, I hope when you when you go to the parade and you get to announce that parade that you think of me for a moment or two. <laughs> you and uh, a lot of other people, yeah. Greatly appreciate it. Well, Tom, I want to say thank you so much for your time, um, taking time away from your family on a Sunday afternoon. I really appreciate this. Like I said, you're a fan of the show, and, and hopingly um, in two and a half weeks' time, you and me are sitting down talking about your memories of the blues skating around with the cup raised really high. Let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and our legs crossed and everything else we can cross. And we'll, uh, we'll hope that works out for us. And I'm, uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. You know, I, I know, well, one last thing. Um, everyone's thinking that that's the next goal for this organization is to win a cup. And actually, to me, it's not the next goal. The next goal is to do, um, there's one thing that this organization hasn't done yet. And it's, you have to do it to get to the cup goal, but they've never won a Stanley Cup Finals game. To me, that's the next goal. When you take it one step at a time, and this team has been absolutely amazing at that. What's the next step?
Bobby play, Bobby said it. You know, the, the, Bobby, they're taking the next step. When he talked about putting the pucks up on the board. I put the first one up, and I hope to put the last one up. Uh, one step at a time. And it's just... That's, what you, that's the way you got to look at it. You know, any kind of athlete, any kind of coach uh, who's been around uh, a little bit understands that you you got to deal with what's right in front of you. And you can't uh, can't look past it because there's too many other things that could mess it up if you do. And um, yeah, like you said, this team has been really good about that, and and that's one of the things that gives me confidence that they're gonna they're gonna do it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And some people might be mad that I'm already talking like they've done it, but I'm gonna preface all of that or with I'm hoping that's what happens. <laughs> well, Tom, there again, you go. Thank you so much, uh, my friend. I say aloha. And mahalo, because you know that I'm bleeding blue with you, and let's go blues. Thanks, guy. Let's go blues. Well, blues fans, I hope you absolutely enjoyed that interview as much as I did sitting down and talking. Tom is a great person. I can't wait to meet him. So, yes, that's the secret out of the bag. I have tickets to Game 3. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to find somewhere to do a live show. So as I'm putting this out, if someone can help me out, um, if I do one near the arena, I need a generator and someone who has mobile a mobile hotspot that they would not be they would allow me to to jump on and use, so I could do a 20 to 30 minute live show somewhere near the arena uh, before the game before um, they open the doors. And one thing that I have been doing is I've been missing fan of the game pet of the game, and tattoo of the game. Well, for this special episode, a little longer than normal, and I know people don't like the long episodes, but you know what? It's the Stanley Cup final. Suck it up. Buttercup, because I have a fan of the game. And my fan of the game is a very special man. My fan of the game is none other than Michael Nixon. Michael Nixon, pictured here, has been a Blues fan his entire life. He has been a season ticket holder for the past 14 years. His daughter is graduating from Francis Hall Central on Saturday evening. It was killing him that he couldn't go to this game. I put a post in the season ticket holder group saying that I was looking for tickets and trying to find something. Mike sent me a message and said, Guy, here's what's going on. I'll yank my tickets off. I'll offer it to you for this price, no fees, um, and, and we'll work with you. I want to go to game five with my daughter, so that's what I'm using the money for. What I paid for these tickets is not exorbitant. It's exorbitant in some minds' eyes, but for that section, it's not. Mike, thank you. you have, you're making a 50-year-old man a very very happy person to, to, to even have the opportunity for for what I'm paying you know is almost what it would cost to get in the door and that didn't make sense to me but for you to give me this this opportunity sir I have nothing but love and respect for you and you deserve to be my fan of the game Mike thank you so much now Pet of the game and tattoo of the game, I don't have express permission to use them. However, both of them have been posted in the groups or in social media, so I'm going to take my chance here. The first one, I posted this picture. I found it online. I posted it in the We All Bleed Blue fan group. Now, guys, when I post my videos, I get maybe one or two likes, you know, some. I posted this picture here of these Siberian Huskies in Blues gear. And you guys went nuts. So I think I'm going to just do the rest of this in dog. And thank you for being my pet. 350 likes, guys. Come on. The dogs. And I get two or three, and I thought you guys loved me. Ah, I just shake my head. 
Now this last one, I've got to, I'm going to pause for a little bit and then come back. I want to make sure I get it right. A tattoo was posted in one of the groups that is absolutely beautiful. I, I'm trying to remember the scene that this was taken from, and I couldn't. Maybe some of you do, but I'm going to show. There's a video of it. Um, it's by the owner of the tattoo shop that did it. And I, at the moment his name slips me, I will pause and come back and get it for you. But this, just watch the video and, and yeah, watch the video. So that tattoo was done by Nathan Alder of Alder Tattoos. Um, I noticed the Pavel Dimitri on it, so I'm thinking that the scene was from a little while back. I don't remember the scene because here at that time, the internet wasn't all that great, and it was really hard to get um, hockey stuff. Um, it had just started moving in, so if someone knows the scene, they can put the note in. And as I get ready to end this wonderful show, do all my fun editing and all that. Woo wee! Okay. So as I get ready to end my show and, and go out and say aloha mahalo, normally I do it, but you know what? This time, and I'm taking this video off of the blues page, so can't get in too much trouble. And me being a sailor, I think the captain and crew of the submarine USS Missouri should tell you this. Aloha St. Louis, my name is Commander George Howe, I'm the commanding officer of the submarine USS Missouri. From the officers and crew of the USS Missouri, congratulations for making it to the Stanley Cup Finals, and good luck. Let's go Blues! Booyah my mouth! Booyah my mouth! Booyah my mouth! Booyah my mouth! Aloha, mahalo, let's go Blues, and I'll be seeing you in St. Louis for Game 3 of those Stanley Cup Finals. Oh, and if you're in Hawaii, I'm hosting a party tomorrow at Rivals in Waikiki. Hope you can make it. Aloha! Oh, when the blues go marching in, oh, I want to be in that number. When the blues go marching in, oh, when the blues go marching in, oh, when the blues go marching in, oh, I want to be in that number when the blues go marching in, oh, when the blues go marching in, oh, when the blues go. Marching in